it's time to start, so we'll, we'll get underway. Uh, the title of my impress, uh, presentation is Examining Combs. What do they tell you? When I first got into beekeeping some, uh, probably 46 years ago, um, we often had what we called bee havers. You could, you could get a colony of bees or a couple colonies of bees, set them out behind your garage, not pay much attention to them all season long, and, and go out in the fall and harvest a honey crop. And uh, obviously, if you did spend some time managing them and, and prov providing adequate and space, and et cetera, they would, they would do a better job. But then in the 80s, the parasitic mites arrived. First the tracheal mites, and then the varroa mites, and now, and now plus a lot of new diseases, et cetera, uh, now it's a challenge to keep bees, okay? And so we want you to try to understand the biology of the bee, and th by understanding the biology of the bee, that will give you a better idea of what you need to do in the way of management. And so our first question or thought is, are you one of those individuals that seldom go out and go down into the brood nest? Okay? And there are people that try to be that type of beekeeper, uh, especially if, if they're scared of being stung, they don't want to break down a, a colony all the way, uh, and they just never look at the brood nest and assume that everything is A-OK. -okay. Well, this is a dangerous practice because your first communication that something is not right is going to probably come to you by examining the brood nest. That's where those subtle cues are going to be that we're going to tell you that something is not right. Now, if you kept bees as long as I have, when I pop the the lid, just by the sound, I have a good inkling, are they okay or is there something wrong? Just by the, the tone of the sound, the roar of the sound, or the hum of the sound, uh, I have an idea if I'm getting into a problem or not. But, but again, that that's comes through uh, experience. Managing the brood nest is important, and I just told you why, because that is where most problems are going to originate. And if you don't go into the brood nest, how are you going to know that there's a problem there? The combs are the basic structural unit of a hive. And that's true if we're looking at, a, at one of them, man-made hives, or if we're looking at a, a hives within a a bee tree or within the wall of a building. They build the, the U-shaped combs that you see here. I'm going to go back and talk about this one a, a bit further. The combs are the basic structure um, of their brood nest, so to speak. Um, this particular comb is upside down. I, I, one of my pres other <coughs> presentations, I mentioned it. This is the top bar. That is the bottom bar. And so what I've done is I've reached down into the brood chamber, I've picked a comb up, turned it like this, and begin examining it, okay? And then had someone take a picture of it or I took a picture of it, whatever. What I want you to realize, the typical pattern that we're going to be looking for as we uh, pull out that brood frame out of the hive is that we expect an area of brood and we have both capped and uncapped brood here. Uncapped brood can be either eggs or larvae. The capped brood is the pupal stage. And then above that, we expect to find two to three inch band of pollen. And then outside of that, we expect to find honey, which will serve as a source of food. There's one chair here. And I guess there's still one back there. Um, so this is what a typical brood comb should look like. Obviously, we might like to see uh, the tire frame covered with, with brood, and we often do find that, but in, in the earlier parts of the season, this would be a typical comb. 
And as I said, whether we're looking at man-made or we're looking at a, a feral colony, uh, the comb is the basic structure of the hive. What are the functions of the comb? First of all, reproduction. Uh, I think there's one chair back over here. Or, or is somebody sitting in it? No. Okay. And there's one back there, okay. Okay, so reproduction of the colony, storage of nectar and pollen. It's the foundation for establishing the, the winter cluster, which is their behavior or way in which they survive the winter. And it's also an orientation point for their communicative dances. And I'll talk more about these uh, as we go. As we said, reproduction is the primary um, reason for the combs, as well as storage of food. Here we see the tiny uh, sausage-shaped egg, young larvae, pre-pupae, pupae, and then ultimately the adult will chew her way out of the cell. Uh, so you need, to, you need to be able to recognize the various stages of bee development. Egg, larva, pupa, and adult. As we said, the second major function of the comb is both the storage of nectar and honey as it's ripened and, the, and pollen. You'll notice that there's some lumps or pellets of pollen here. It's not packed into the cell. What you need to realize is as a worker returns uh, from the field with her pollen baskets loaded with pollen, she backs into a cell and knocks those pellets off with spines on her legs, okay? So she basically kicks those pellets off into the cell as you see here. Other house bees come along and use their head and pack it, okay? Now, as they are collecting pollen, as they are packing pollen, and as they are unloading the pollen load, they add some chemicals to it. And these chemicals we like to think of as starting digestion. If you look at pollen grains under a microscope, you will find that they have hard outer exines or coverings to protect the germplasm uh, that's located within the cell. It's very difficult for the bees to digest or break through those uh, exines, as they're called, or that, that thick shell. And so adding chemicals as the pollen is being stored uh, then begins the digestive process. It keeps the pollen from, from spoiling and also starts the digestive uh, process. Pollen cells are never capped. Now, if you go into a colony and you find that the pollen looks old and the pollen is wet on the surface, that's usually an indication of a lack of brood and possibly even a lack of, of queen. When a honeybee goes out to forage, is it going to collect pollen? Is it going to collect nectar, or is it going to collect both? Uh, it, it depends upon numerous stimuli, but the presence of brood and the presence of a laying queen and the pheromones produced by the brood then will stimulate them to collect pollen. And so if you find your pollen is not <laughs> fresh, your pollen is wet, it looks old, chances are that's, that's a cue or an indication that you've got a, a queen problem and a lack of brood and you need to pursue it uh, further. But they never put a wax covering over pollen. They only put wax covering over the honey when it's fully ripened. How do you know it's old pollen? Basically color. It, dar it darkens in, in time. Even though it might be bright orange and red and, and yellow when it's collected, as it's stored over time, it will darken, and most of it will have a brownish cast to it. Okay? It's still good. You can use it's still good, but, uh, not good. But, but not as good. But it, as I say, it should be a cue to you that there's a problem 
in the reproduction of the colony that you need to pursue further. Thank you for the answer. If a colony, let's say you had it on a colony, it dies in the winter, you know, Brooklyn kind of hunts pennies. You can take those frames and give them to another colony as long as you're, you're sure that there's not a disease associated with why that colony died. Okay? So will use old pollen? You can use old pollen, but it may not be as nutritious. Is, is, is what we're, we're saying to you. In this gas, um, when they mummify pollen, what is it called? Entombment. Entombment. Yeah. 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 Do they, they don't, what do they use? Wax or? Yeah, wax. Yeah. yeah, wax. And I, I'm still learning about that because that's, see, that's a relatively new uh, observation by Dennis Van Engelsdorf. And, and so I still got to spend some more time uh, with that. Here we see, we said that the, the, crane, the combs are the foundation on which they form the winter cluster. This is a remnant of a dead winter cluster in the spring. Now we could easily examine the comb and find out that it's bone dry, there's no food, and chances are this colony uh, died uh, because of, of starvation. The winter cluster, the winter cluster I want you to think of it as a large sphere of bees separated by combs. And if you look at that in cross section, you would find that the outer two to three inches of bees are insulating bees. As, the, as it gets colder and colder outside, the cluster contracts. But the bees that are loosely packed in the middle are the heat producers. And so this, this outer two to three inches on the surface of the cluster, they're insulators. They're trying to conserve the heat energy that's being produced in the interior of the cluster. So this is another important point for you to, to remember. They do not heat the entire hive. They only heat the area within the winter cluster. Here's another dead cluster in the spring, just to give you a, a better idea of, of what, what we're talking about. But if, you, if they do not have comb surface on which to form, containing some empty cells in which to form the winter cluster, then they will not be able to go through this uh, mechanism. We also said the combs are the dance floors for their communicative dances. And on the, your left, is the round dance. And basically they just go, and then they periodically will stop, and they will dispense droplets of nectar uh, to the bees surrounding them and following the dance. They will also allow the bees surrounding them to touch them with their antenna, to become familiar with the aroma of the food source on which they are visiting. And basically the round dance just says, this is what this food source tastes like. This is what the food source smells like. Go out within 100 yards of the hive and search for it. On, the, on your right, this is the waggle dance or the wagtail dance. And they, with this dance, they indicate what direction uh, they have to fly, what direction they have to fly, and how much energy they have to expend to make that trip, in other words, both distance and direction are indicated in this uh, dance. And the bee goes up, wags its abdomen. The faster it wags its abdomen, the, the more energy is expended. That's the further away that the, the source is. And it, they just do the figure eight and keep doing it again. Come on down, do it again. This one is going up the comb. And so that says go out and fly straight towards the sun. If they're doing the waggle down the comb, it says go out and fly directly away from the sun. But if they do this waggle at a certain angle, say a 45 degree angle, then it says go out and, and, and go foraging uh, at a 45 degree angle uh, to, to the sun. And so the, the, these dances, these communicative dances, are fascinating to watch and to understand what they're doing. Again, for the inexperienced beekeepers in here, you need to learn to distinguish the various uh, components that we expect you would find on a comb. This is capped honey up here. Have I got, is there a red dot? I don't see it. 
capped honey up there. Those open cells are pollen. These are capped brood cells. These are capped worker pupae. These are capped drone pupae. The cappings on drones are bullet shaped. The cells are wider. The cells are deeper. And then they've got the bullet shaped cappings. And these are just slightly uh, concave. These are really bullet shaped. So and so you need to be able to learn to distinguish between these. Yes? Is there any particular direction where you put the comb maybe the, uh, like on or <coughs> Yeah, I, you probably came in after I, I said it. Typically, we'll have brood, two to three inches of pollen, and then honey above that, OK? You'll soon learn as you're in beekeeping that a limiting factor to your expansion is not having adequate supplies of, of drawn comb. And so every chance you get to draw some foundation to produce comb, uh, we would encourage you to do it. The best way to draw a comb is to go out and collect swarms. The population of bees within a swarm, about, probably about 80% of them, have their wax glands active, ready to build, because they've got to have a, establish a new home once they've completed the swarming process. And so that is an excellent way to draw comb, is to go out and collect swarms and install them on foundation. You need to understand within the brood nest, we have something that is called bee space. <coughs> and bee space is defined as one quarter to three eighths of an inch. Anything less than a quarter of an inch, the bees are going to fill that crack or that crevice with a material that we call propolis. Okay, and there was a talk yesterday afternoon on propolis, resins, plant resins. Or if the, air, the gap is greater than three eighths of an inch, they will build brace comb and burr comb. But between one quarter of an inch and three eighths of an inch, they will leave it open. And so if you have a colony that has a lot of burr comb, a lot of brace comb, uh, that tells you then the dimensions, the bee space is off. Uh, possibly you've got a mixture of equipment from, from various sources and the gappings are not right, et cetera. Again, the bees don't care. It's just more brace comb, more burr comb, which our artist friend uh, uses in his, his uh, creations. Um, it, will, uh, it will just hinder you somewhat in, in your management. I'm, uh, I'm sure I'm the only one here that encourages it. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and this is just a bad example of a lot of burr comb where the spacings are not right <coughs> between the, the bottom bars and the top bars as well as between the combs themselves. All right, you need to realize if combs get damaged, uh, you have a loss of brood area. You will have an increase in drone brood. The reason is, let's say a section of comb gets damaged. They will usually rebuild it if they are successful in rebuilding it with drone size cells rather than worker size cells. And so that will increase then the amount of drone brood in the county. And of course, if, it, if your comb's really warped and, and different heights, et cetera, um, that gives you increased difficulty in uncapping the honey do, at the time of extraction. Yes? Do they do that so that they don't have to put it on the bottoms of the frame? Does that save them work by putting the drone in the damaged areas? Why do they do it? Because it messes up what I want them to do. Uh, I think it's just they see it as a place it to build comb. Yeah, it doesn't look pretty. No. no, you're absolutely right. Doesn't look pretty at all. Here's an, here's an area that, that was damaged slightly, but not enough. These are still worker, worker size cells. But here, this is what I'm talking about. Yeah. You can see where the drone size cells uh, have been built into the comb where uh, there were worker size cells. Uh, again, it's just a natural behavior. I don't know if we can all totally understand why. I and mean, I don't think the bees are thinking why, as you implied. <laughs> Yes, they want a certain amount of drone comb, and there we is a. Don't provide that at all. And we don't provide it. You're absolutely right. They got to build it somewhere. So 
So Sorry? We, should we begin to provide it? Uh, there would be nothing wrong in providing some, especially if you wanted to use the removal of, of drone brood uh, as part of your Varroa mite IPM program. Okay, then that, that would be good. Or if you want to produce drones and you're raising queens and you want to produce drones for mating purposes, yes, then we would supply additional drone comb. But you need to realize, and I did a, an experiment when I was at Penn State, we were trying to look at the position of drone comb in the hive and, and we were trying to increase the production of drone comb. But there is an upper limit. There is an upper limit. Even though we would give them solid sheets of drone foundation, once they had this upper limit on the amount of drone comb, which usually runs around 10 to 12 percent, uh, in the hive, they modified that drone foundation into worker size cells and just made an absolute mess. <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm saying there is an upper limit. Yes? Uh, provided that you already have a beta queen, she's there working, um, and then you're not looking for extra drones, what would you do with that comb? Uh, I would probably call it. Uh, take it out. Take the whole frame out and replace it with, with a frame of, of foundation. They will put honey in it, though. Oh, yeah, they'll store honey in it. They'll store drone or raise br drones in it. Um, but it's just, if you got a lot of it, it, it should just be replaced. Um, but to show you how t times have changed, when I took my first beekeeping class in 1966 at Michigan State, <coughs> The professor said, if you really do a good job of putting a comb together, nailing it, gluing it, wiring it, a good comb ought to last you 25 years. <laughs> yes, the wax may be coal black in color, but that's still all right with the bees. They don't care. Now we talk about replacing comb every two, three years because of all the disease problems, uh, et cetera. So see how times change. All right, we said we want you to go into the brood nest and we want you to examine the brood nest because that's where your problems are going to start out. First of all, looking in the brood nest, you get an indication of the overall condition of your colony. Secondly, you suddenly realize whether or not you have a queen. If you, now I know beginners feel though I want to go in and I want to see the queen. You don't have to see the queen. If you go in and you see eggs, that tells you there's been a queen in the last three days. Because from the time an egg is laid until it hatches is three days. So you don't have to see the queen, even though I, a lot of people get a thrill out of seeing a queen. You don't have to. So it will tell you whether or not you've got a queen. By examining the brood pattern, and we'll talk more about this, it gives you an idea or an indication of the quality of the queen if she's present. It tells you that if they're in a nectar flow or in a pollen flow, if there's fresh food coming in. This is where you're going to check for bee diseases and check for, check for mites. And it will also give you an indication of colony strength and, and whether or not they're preparing to swarm. And a concept that's difficult to interpret and we may not even get, have time to get to it today, but the idea if there's a population balance of, of the different ages of bees uh, within the hive. Just by looking in the brood comb, looking at, uh, looking at the brood combs, looking in the brood nest, all these things uh, can be determined. So th this is very, very important part of, of management that you do spend time in the brood nest. Queenlessness. How do you recognize it? Well, first of all, they may be quite aggressive when you open the colony. Secondly, they may be roaring, loud sounds. As I said, you're going to look for lack of eggs or young brood. You're going to look for signs of laying workers, and I'll talk about what signs those are in a few minutes. You're going to look for a virgin queen. Virgin queens are usually difficult to spot. She's smaller than a normal queen. She's usually very nervous. She's running all over the place. So 
it's difficult to see a virgin queen, but you need to look. As I say, you listen to the sound of the bees, you look at pollen. And, this, and I've already mentioned this, is there fresh pollen in the combs, or is the pollen old and has a glossy or, or wet appearance? Yes. Okay, I was near our hive one day, and out of the clear blue sky, it just started the game. Real noisy. I wasn't even bothered. It just started being noisy. It was that way probably for 10, 15 minutes. I would say chances are they were preparing to swarm. They go through dances. They literally drive the old queen out. Uh, so there's, a, there's, a, there's a going to be an increase in sound when they're going to. And suddenly these colonies will begin to roar so to speak, but usually it wouldn't last for 10 or 15 minutes. Usually, the, suddenly the air will fill up with bees. But I would get, if I had to guess, that would be what, what was going on in, in your case. As we said, it's going to give you an indication of the quality of the queen. Now, when I teach beginners, the first thing that I try to teach them is how to see eggs. And it's difficult for a, a lot of people, okay? It's difficult. The best way to do it is you take your comb, and say the sun's up here. You will turn and let the sun come over your shoulder. You have hold the comb like this and you go like this, letting the sun light bounce off the bottom of the cells, which will help you then see these tiny eggs in the bottom of the cells. Of course, now now we have black foundation, which is supposed to make it easier for you to see the eggs. But it's so important for you to, to be able to spot eggs because it will help you understand the quality of your queen. And as we've already said, it'll tell you if there's been a queen there in the last three days or not. So this is extremely important. And as I say, usually one of the first times I take a beginner's group in the bee yard, this is one of the things that I'll teach them. Yes? Is there any difference or just the disadvantages in the black foundation versus the natural foundation? The question was, are there any uh, differences in the black foundation and wax foundation or plastic foundation, etc.? cetera? Uh, I'm not aware of any specific evidence that would show that black is bad or detrimental. I personally like wax over plastic, but that's just old school. <laughs> Eggs, are they usually attached at the top of the cell? No, they're attached to the bottom of the cell. As you see here, this, this is the bottom of the cell. And it's usually near the center. Not exactly, but usually near the center. Okay? That's what you want to look for. Okay, you look at a queen. You say, wow, she's nice looking. Well, you can be good looking and not worth a flip when it comes to <laughs> reproduction in the, in, the <laughs> in, in the colony. So you really can't tell anything by just looking at a queen. Yeah, you can say she's big, she's little, uh, but that's the extent. So the way we examine the, the, or determine the quality of the queen, we examine the brood pattern. Is it a solid brood pattern or is it a, a spotty brood pattern? This would be a good brood pattern. It's relatively solid. There's a few openings, but it's, it's, it's basically a good brood pattern. Even though this is much smaller, and this was obviously taken earlier in the, in the spring than the other one, it's still a very solid brood pattern, and it, so our conclusion would be this is a good queen. The material on that slide there off to the right, is that honey? Yes, this is cap honey here. Cap honey, and this is the brood here. Is it always lighter, the honey? Usually, but I can't say always, because it's been, how long has it been stored there? How long has it been kept? You'll notice this is much darker here than here, so this would tell us this is newer than, than here. Yes? Is, you know, you have that classic rainbow shape. If you have a brood pattern that absolutely fills the frame, is that less desirable because they don't have adjacent available food stores? we would assume that they can get their food from the adjacent combs. Now, it, it says you've got a great queen and she's going great guns and so <coughs> things are, are going well. Okay. Yes, if there was some food on it, it would be better, 
but it's not absolutely necessary. Yes? How do you differentiate <coughs> a spotty brew scanner and getting the results of a poor king versus a giant brew? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, a spotty brewed pattern, I would say, has a lot more openings, open cells, than in the case of hygienic behavior. Um, but again, I really would need to go into that in more depth, and, and I don't have the time. But uh, I, I, my first reaction would be that would be the first thing, uh, how I would differentiate between them. And I thought I was going to show you a spotty brood pattern, and I don't know where that slide is, so we'll keep going. We said you also need to be looking for laying workers. With laying workers, you are going to look for multiple eggs per cell, and they're no longer going to be placed near the center of the bottom of the cell. They're going to be on the sides and every imaginable low position uh, within the cell, as you see here. Uh, those of you that were at my bee pheromone talk the other day, we know that the queen's pheromone uh, prevents the, the worker ovaries from developing, but when you've got a queenless situation for two to three weeks, then you may end up getting uh, laying workers as you see here. But they cannot fertilize their eggs, so that means they only produce drones. But what you're looking for is multiple eggs per cell. Now occasionally, occasionally you will find not this many eggs per cell, but maybe two or three eggs per cell, if the queen does not have adequate space to lay. If she's a good queen, and, and I've seen, the times that I've seen this is that we've installed packages on foundation. And they started drawing the foundation, but the queen is laying faster than which they're, they're producing cells for her to lay in. And in that instance, I have seen multiple eggs per cell that was not laying workers. But normally, multiple eggs per cell would be laying workers. We heard yesterday also a brand new mated queen might do that until she figures out how to do one of her pawns. Right. Again, a, a beginning package or a beginning queen um, is, uh, is where you would likely see it. All right. We said we're going to be checking the brood area for diseases and for, for mites. Um, we're going to be looking at the cappings. We're going to be looking for color changes in larvae and pupae. We're going to be looking for scale. And we're going to be looking for mummies. And I'll talk about these uh, as, as we go. When the larva is about finished feeding and being cared for by nurse bees, then they become, they molt and become a, what we call a pre -pupae. And at that time, the, the bees will begin building a, a wax capping to go over it, as you see here. Now again, when I'm out in the bee yard with beginners, I tell them any time that you see a hole in a capping, especially if you see several, you may want to investigate just a bit further. But, but these are healthy cappings. And these are healthy cappings based on their, their color and based on the opening in the capping is only in the very center of the cell. Because as they build the capping, they start at the outside and work towards the center. And so if you see a hole in a capping right in the center, chances are everything's OK. And they are just in the process of building that capping. We can't base it all on color because you need to realize that when they build cappings that go over developing young, a lot of the wax that they use is being recycled. In other words, when they cap a honey cell, it's mostly new fresh wax. But when they cap a brood cell, they're using all the bits of wax from bees that have emerged and then cleaning cells, etc. And so if this comb is dark in color, 
and they're recycling that wax, uh, what I'm telling you is those cappings are going to be darker in color than as we see here where this was obviously a relatively new comb and they're, they're building the cappings over the young there. All right, we got two problems here. We got a spotty brood pattern, okay? We got a spotty brood pattern, but we've also got some holes. And we've got a third condition here that tells us that something's not right. You see some sunken cappings? Do I need to point them out or do you see them? Sunken cappings. Here, 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 here. All right. So there are three things here that tell us, mm, I need to investigate further. Spotty brood pattern, holes in cappings, and some sunken cappings. Okay? So that's the evidence that you would be, be looking for. Of course, this one is really old and dark, but it's sunken, and the holes are very irregular. This is definitely a serious problem. You need, you need to investigate further. You may even need help. You may even need to have an inspector come and, and look. All right. So that's what we learned from looking at cappings. Color, holes, sunken or regular, and spotty. We said we would be looking for color changes in larvae and pupae. If you remember nothing else today, I want you to remember that white is healthy. White is healthy. All right? These are larvae at different sizes, but they're white in color, and that says everything's good to go. Here we see a pre pupae. Yeah, there's a little darkness here, but not much. It's basically white, and it's healthy, and, and it's good to go. Here's a pupae. The only darkening area that we see at this point in time is the compound eye. That's natural. We're not going to be concerned about it. The bulk of the body is white, and, and that's a healthy pupae. Whoops. All right. Let's look at this one first of all. That's not right. Here's one. That's definitely not right. That one is starting to have some discoloration. This one's got discoloration. It's also in a strange position. So the position of the larvae, but more importantly, the coloration of the larvae is an indication that something is not right. Here we see a pre -pupy. Here we've got a uniform color change, but it's not white. And that says we've got a problem, okay? Here we have a pupae. It's not white. We got a problem. We also got something else here. This is called a pupil tongue. It's the proboscis. And if you see pupil tongues, you don't need to go any further. You've got a serious problem. Now let me just back up and I'll tell you what we're looking at. Oops. This is European fall brood. Gradual color changes. Open cells. Twisted appearance in the cell on, in some instances. It's like they're in agony and they're they got a stomach ache and they're twisting in the cell. Okay? You probably don't realize it, but actually a larva lying on a bed of royal jelly actually does go round and round as it's feeding. So it does move, but if it's not moving on a bed of royal jelly and it's off to the side, that's an indication of a problem. This is American fowl brood. We have a uniform color change. We do not have a uniform color change with European. We have a uniform with American and this old cell will be capped. 
whereas European will be uncapped. This is also American fowl brood at, in the pupil stage. There's actually a four-day period in which death can occur. The first two, two days of the pupil period, and the, or the last two days of the pre-pupa, and the first two days of the pupil period. But if you see a pupil tongue and discoloration, you don't need to go any further. Now you can see a colony of American fowl brood with all these symptoms that I've already described to you and never see a pupil tongue. But I'm telling you, if you do see pupil tongues, there's no need to go any further. It just has to do with uh, how lethal that bacterium is, whether it's killing him in the early, of uh, that four-day period when death can occur, are they killing him in the first couple of days, or are they killing him in the latter two days? That's the only difference. It has to do with the lethality of the, of the uh, bacterium. All right, this is sac brood. Sac brood, there's some white here, but the head end usually darkens first to a sac brood, and usually they die with raised heads. So this is sac brood disease. We said you're going to look for scale. These are scales where they died, they decomposed, they dried down. So anytime you look at a brood comb, you're going to be looking for scale. And this is American fowl brood. Every one of those scales contain millions of spores. And of course, the bees can't remove the scale, so they put honey on it. That softens the scale and those millions of spores then work up in the honey, and then when that honey is used or robbed out, or et cetera, the, the disease uh, is spread. We said you're gonna look for mummies. These look like pieces of chalk. The disease is chalk brood. It's a, a fungal disease. We call these chalk brood mummies. They're hard. You rattle a comb, and you can hear them, and some of these mummies will fall out. You may find these, these mummies uh, at the hive entrance uh, as well. This is chalk brood. All right, now, yes, question. You could also find mummies on the um, landing board if it's been cold and they, they, pull, they died and they pull them out. Yeah. Would there be a difference in? You, you can find them at the entrance. You can find them on the landing board. You can find them in the combs. Okay, would there be a difference in color? In chalk board as opposed to? In chalk brood, it depends on if the, the um, Fungi associated with it reproduce sexually or asexually. Whether there are spore sporangia or spore forming uh, on the sur spore forming organs on the surface uh, of the um, larva or, or or not. So the coloration has to do with the different strains of chalk brood and how they reproduce. Not so much how in relation to the bees. What if the bees? Kill a dead larvae or something's wrong with it. They'll still pull it out. Yeah, it a dead larvae, uh, they'll throw it out, but it won't be hard like a piece of chalk. It won't look like a mummy. You know, if you think of an Egyptian mummy, uh, it won't have any appearance like that whatsoever. On a chalk brood condition, usually shady colony, weak colony, or bad <coughs> queen. If you take, might be a mistake, but take the frame that has the brood and the chalk brood, if you strong colony, can they overcome it, or are you just going to transfer that? Well, you're going to transfer it. You're going to transfer the spores associated with it. So you're going to transfer it, but the strong colony ought to be able to handle it better than the weak colony. There has to be a, the, the young larva has to feed on the spores, and then there has to be a period of chilling. In other words, the colony is weak, so they can't maintain a 93 to 95 degree brood temperature. And so there has, there's a chilling involved. Uh, but, so a strong colony would do better than a weak colony. But I wouldn't transfer it to a, a strong colony because you're just transferring the disease. All right, you've got to learn to distinguish between drone brood and worker brood. You see how dark these cappings are? This is per perfectly healthy. It's just they're using old, dark wax as they recycle it to produce the cappings. But what the point here is, you've got to be able to distinguish between these. 
and then check for um, Varroa mites. If you want to examine a colony for Varroa mites, sure, you can use just the sugar shake technique, you can use the ether roll technique, uh, but a good way to just quickly check and see, get a, a feel for, for your mite levels uh, is go to cap drone brood. And you can just take a capping scratcher, run it through the side of the, uh, uh, the cappings and pull the, the, the pupae out and look for varroa mites, varroa mites crawling on the surface. Yes? What is the treatment threshold? There really isn't for just examining drone brood, but you can get a good, certainly a good indication uh, of whether or not you, you ha maybe ought to do an ether roll or a sugar shake or something, and where there, there are thresholds established uh, to. Do you see mites on uncapped larvae? No, not normally. Normally you're not going to see them until the, the cell is capped. But the, the varroa mites prefer drone brood over worker brood because it's a longer time period and they can produce more offspring during that time period. And it's probably a little cooler. And they seem to do better in, in the cooler situation. How about for yourself? I mean, if you're looking at that, where, at what rate do you start to think of it as a problem? At what rate if I if I examined if I examined say two or examined ten capped drone cells and I found two or three mites I would say yeah I need to do something but if, but if I, I examined ten and I don't find any then I'm probably saying I don't need to worry about it if you found one in ten I would examine further. Okay. The state of the one in ten rate, that seems to you like kind of a normal rate that a hive can handle or Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Good. Yeah. It, but it's not an established backed up with a scientific evidence uh, threshold. <laughs> right, right. I've I've taught a lot of short courses over the years and of course spent a lot of time in the bee yard with, with people and and uh, I can think of <coughs> several short courses in, in Mississippi. We always had a Central Jackson beekeeping short course every year, and we always went to the same beekeeper's yard. And I was always demonstrating, this is how we examine for varroa mites. And I don't know how many hundreds of capped drone cells over the years I uncapped in that yard, and I never found a single mite. Now, I don't know what he was using. I'm sure it was probably not legal. <laughs> But I could never find varroa mites to demonstrate to, to my students. About three years before I retired, I was doing a short course in Tupelo, Mississippi. And we were out in a commercial beekeeper's yard. And I was going to show them how to look for mites. And I, ha I usually carry a pair of forceps and I just rip the, the, the capping off and pull the pupae out. And the first cell I went to, I pulled the pupae out. There were eight adult female mites crawling on that one pupae. Eight. That's the most I've ever seen, by far. <laughs> Sometimes you'll see two, maybe three, but I've never seen eight. But I could not believe my eyes. Of course, we uncapped a few more. and I didn't find another eight, but I found multiple mites almost per cell. So obviously they had a they had a serious multiple problem. Females were crawling through the cell. What? Multiple females. Yes, so multiple. F we female. call them we call them foundress females. Multiple females will call in crawl into a cell, and and reproduce. Yes. But it only takes one. <laughs> All right. If you see larvae crawling over the comb, and no webbing. You've probably got a small hive beetle problem. I don't know how prevalent that is in Michigan. Um, it's really bad in the south, I can assure you. But no, no webbing whatsoever. So that's pro likely to be a uh, small hive beetle. If you see webbing, that's probably wax moth. Um, all right. 
We said another reason for examining the brood combs is to get an idea on the strength of the colony. How many combs are the bees covering? Compare the strength of this colony to this colony early in, in the winter. And so you can get a good indication of the strength of your colony. You can also, and I, I know I'm about out of time, but if you just give me a couple more minutes, I'll, I'll kind of finish up here. When, um, it'll tell you when additional honey supers are needed. Some of you may put on a honey super or two honey supers, and when they're full, you say, well, I guess it's time to add another one. I'm suggesting to you that you see this little streak of fresh white wax here along the edge? When you see two or three combs with these fresh streaks of white wax, I would then add the next super. So to look for that fresh white wax, and I would add the next super. Typically, we're going to over super in the spring. We're going to under super in the fall. Um, you need to realize that empty comb stimulates hoarding. And we're taking advantage of this hoarding behavior of the honeybee. The honeybees, when, as weather conditions will allow, will go out and work every day that weather permits as though the cupboard is bare. Okay? And so we're trying to take advantage. We're trying to stimulate that hoarding instinct and give them added, added comb before they need it to hopefully stimulate foraging even more. Yes? When you're telling your students um, about putting uh, boxes on, when you have starting out with foundation, at what point do you tell them to put some more foundation on? When they started out with a package, you know what I mean? When I start seeing a lot of fresh nectar in the brood nest that's going to crowd out the queen, then I'm going to add it. You know, because they put on, they, they say they go and they got it going and, and, and the nectar's coming in and they got their first honey super on. And if I would, if the brood chambers, I, I would say, are two-thirds drawn, but there's fresh nectar coming in, yeah. I'm going to add a, the first, first super. All right, we don't have time, and it's probably a little over your head anyway. So this is, this is a good place to stop. All right. Let me just summarize by saying you need to spend time in the brood nest. I've given you a lot of characteristics and cues that you can use to determine if things are good or if things are not so good. You're going to look at cappings. You're going to look at the color of the larvae and the pupae. You're going to look for eggs. You're going to look at the brood pattern. And you're going to look to see if they are preparing to swarm, which they will prepare queen cells or swarm cells. And I didn't get to that either, but I did in another presentation. Um, so I'm saying you can learn a lot. But those are the things you need to be looking for. And I hope you have a great year in beekeeping.